Thank you for joining us. Please turn in your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. We're going to start at verses 1 and 2. While you turn over there, my name is Nathan Grisham. I'm the youth minister at Dogwood Grove Baptist Church. Um, we thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, if you like this video, please look down at the bottom of the screen. You'll see other uh, videos that we've recorded as well. Um, and our hope and what our desire is, is that you'll dive in, read these videos, and you'll grow closer to the Lord. Um, yeah, I'm a youth minister, and my students at church do watch these videos, but they're also designed for parents and grandparents and 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 just people, just Christian people who want to grow or folks who are not Christian people who want to learn and understand more. And our prayer and hope is that when that happens, that, that you, the non-Christian believer, will invite Jesus into your heart and that God will use these. So, but we just pray you grow close to the Lord. So I'm going to lead us in prayer and then we're going to dive in here and talk about King Manasseh. Father, we love you. God, thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for the chance to study your word today. And, um, and God, I pray you use your word to help us grow closer to you. God bless each and every person uh, watching this video today. In your name I pray, amen. Second, Second Chronicles chapter 29, verses one and two. Uh, we're going to talk about Manasseh um, today, but in order to talk about Manasseh, we kind of go back, have to go back and look where he was coming from. Uh, Manasseh's dad was King Hezekiah. And, and so when you look in, in Second Chronicles chapter 29, verses 1 and 2, it says Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years his mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Um, when you when you look in Second um, Chronicles, and when they're talking about the kings, with every king, the first paragraph it tells you all you need to know. It will tell you if they were a good king or they were evil king. And Hezekiah it tells you that during his reign. He was a good king. So now let's fast forward to Manasseh. Manasseh was Hezekiah's son. You know that Manasseh was raised right. You know that his dad taught him um, the ways of the Lord. You know that his dad, um, he should have known what was right to do what was right. And so Manasseh comes up as king after King Hezekiah. And chapter 33 is where we have um is where we have Manasseh. Chapter 33, verse 1, it says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. And that's long for the reign of a king uh, when, you're, when you're going through all these kings. Um, that's a very long time. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following in the test detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So immediately we find out when they're describing Manasseh, like I said, when you're reading about these kings, the first couple of verses are going to tell you what they are. And immediately it tells us that Manasseh uh, was evil and did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Like I said, you know, Manasseh was raised in a godly home. He heard about God. Uh, his dad was the king and was a godly ruler, but Manasseh went in the wrong direction. I wonder when you have a 12 year old ruling, if he was influenced by other people mm, that were around him that caused him to make these bad decisions. But whatever it was, he made bad decisions and went the wrong way. Now, here's the thing is you're a mom and dad. Or you're listening to this as, and, and watching this and raise your children right. You know, Hezekiah raised him right. He made bad decisions and went in the wrong direction. But I think you're going to see by the time we get done with this, there, that there is hope, mom and dad. And, and we do need to take the time with our kids and pour into them and make sure that they are godly children. That they know the scriptures. They know God's word. They know how to pray. That we raise them where Jesus is important and church is important. And, and, and that's hugely important. And I think Manasseh was taught this as well. Um, but as parents, we cannot make our children uh, make great decisions. We can give them the tools for it. We can teach them. We can raise them in the right way, but our children can still make bad decisions. And uh, for you teenagers watching this here, um, I tell you, listen to your parents. Listen to what they say. Listen to what they're telling you, uh, especially if you have godly parents. Um, listen to what they say and don't let others persuade you uh, to go in the wrong direction. Uh, and, and I challenge you teenagers, as you look and find your mentors, find godly people who you can look up to, who, who, who you can use as a bar to set the bar of who you want to be and how you want to carry yourself. Um, in verse three, it says that he rebuilt the high places 
his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars uh, to the Baals and made his shira poles. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshiped them. Um, he, he went way off. Uh, not only did he do evil uh, and an evil king, his evil was spiritual things and the fact that he turned and started worshiping false gods. And this is one of the things that God told the Israel children as they were coming in the promised land. Run all these people off. Get these people out of the land. And if you don't, you're going to follow their gods, start following their practices. And, and remember, one of the main things that God said about them coming in is that he, he is God. He is the only God, and he wants to be worshipped. He doesn't want anybody else to be worshipped. And the Bible says he's a jealous God. He, he wants to be worshipped. He deserves that. He is worthy to be praised. And so when, when um, Manasseh does this, and he starts worshipping these false gods again, uh, he, he's going down the wrong road immediately, not following the examples that his dad gave him. And so in verse 3, um, we see what he's doing. Verse 4, he built altars in the temple of the Lord, which which in the temple of the Lord, in verse 5, um, in both courts and the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. Um, verse 6, it really goes astray here, showing you how evil this guy was in verse 6. It says he sacrificed his sons in the fire of the valley of ben Hinnom and practiced sorcery, uh, divination, witchcraft, and consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil things in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Um, Manasseh was involved in every evil thing you could possibly imagine. And so we'll we'll look at some of these right here. And it, it, in the first thing, he talks about him sacrificing his sons in the fire. Um, for a king, uh, a king wanted to have children so that he could have heirs to the throne. And it stay in his bloodline and stay in his family. For a king to destroy his sons uh, is just horrible. It's awful. And, and to do this for a false god, it shows you how far that he had left God. Uh, he was not listening to God. He was not worshiping God. Uh, he was not in the temple with the priest, making sure he was doing godly things. And, and, and if you're watching this today and you're a parent, I cannot fathom in my mind uh, sacrificing my children. Uh, that's crazy to me. Um, and it just shows you how far that his sin had gone. So the first one it talks about his dad, it says he practiced sorcery, sorcery and witchcraft. He consulted mediums and spiritists. Okay. Now, now this is talking about, um, sorcery and witchcraft. You can go into fortune tellers and people who are trying to tell the future and then and then witchcraft we're talking about satan we're talking about all kinds of things that that he is involved in as a christian you don't need anybody to tell you what your future is you know what your future is my friend my future is a home in heaven jesus died on the cross went to the grave defeated death and is in heaven prepared for a home for me and that's my future i don't need a man or a woman to sit down and tell me my past or my future, because I know what my future is. My future is a home in heaven, and it's already been laid out in the Bible, and I know who wins. I'm on the winning side, so I don't need anybody to tell me what the future is, because my God knows what tomorrow holds, and he will give me the strength and the wisdom and the ability to deal with tomorrow um, if I allow him to do that. So um, the, it, it's clear in Leviticus when you're reading that, it talks about not getting involved in these things. And he should have known better. He knew what the law was. Um, his dad taught him what the law was. His dad taught him what he needed to do. But here's what happened. Is that sin will take us farther than we want to go. And it'll make us stay longer than we want to stay. And, and so that's what he did. As, as one sin happens and another sin happens, and he starts, starts domino. And until now, you've just built a big wall of sin. You know, um, my wife has said something awesome over the years. I've heard her say it many times. And she says, don't sin and get to the point to where you don't hear that voice anymore. You don't hear the Holy Spirit telling you not to do something. And, and so he had reached that point where God was not speaking to him. He was not listening to God. He was not worshiping to God. And, and he just went downhill on that slide. And, and I've said this for years is that you you have people that that they put themselves in bad situations with the wrong people. And then it's just one drink and then it's just two drinks. 
Then it's just smoking one joint. Then it's smoking another joint. And then you have somebody say, well, it's just, it's just one abortion. And then it's another abortion. And it just, just all these many things. And they start piling up and adding up, adding up bad choices, bad decisions. And now all of a sudden uh, you find yourself where Manasseh was. And, and in verse seven, uh, it says that, um, it says he took the carved image that he had made and he put it in God's temple. Um, he put carved idols. He just didn't have idols in the land. He had them in, in the temple, in God's house. Imagine coming into your church um, on Sunday and, and there being an idol in the altar uh, to a false god. Can you imagine that? And, and that's what he did. He totally defiled the temple. And in verse 10, it says the Lord spoke to him. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. God, with all this that we just said in these first nine verses and everything that had gone on in Manasseh's life, God was still trying to speak to him. God was angry, but God was trying to speak to him, still trying to draw him in. God had not turned him over yet to let him be defeated. He was still giving him chances. He was still speaking to him. I love this about our God is our God is a very patient and loving God. And, and he gives us so many opportunities uh, through Jesus as a Christian to seek forgiveness and gives us that forgiveness for the things that we do wrong. And he was trying to do this with Manasseh as well. He was speaking to him and try and says that Manasseh wasn't listening and his people wasn't listening. Here's the problem. Manasseh didn't surround himself with godly people like his uh, forefathers did with David. When David had Nathan, who the prophet Nathan would go stick his finger in David's face and tell him, you're sinning and you're doing wrong. I don't believe Manasseh had that around him. And that caused that caused him all kinds of trouble. Um, and then we go to verse 11. It says that in verse 11, it says, uh, so the Lord brought against them, this is talking about Manasseh, the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner. He put a hook in his nose or a ring in his nose, bound him in bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. Okay. Um, so they took Manasseh. God allowed Manasseh to be turned over the king. He allowed him to become a prisoner and a slave. Picture him with that ring that bull ring in his nose symbolizing that he was a slave, that he was owned by somebody. Here's the king bound in chains. God turned him over. There's consequences for sin. And Manasseh found this consequence for sin. And he found himself in a bad spot. Okay. God had had enough. Okay. As Christians, God is only going to let you go so far if you continue to sin and do these things. And you know why? Because he is a loving God in the same way that, that when you acted a fool at a certain point that your parents busted your tail and gave you a spanking and they did it to me. And I needed that. I needed that correction. OK, um, be it if you ground your kids or you take something away or your parents ground you or take something away, whether they spank you or whatever, whatever these disciplines are. We need discipline, and God disciplines us as well, and God did this to Manasseh, and Manasseh found himself in a bad situation. Imagine going from a palace where you have everything that you could possibly imagine. You have all the food. You have all the drink. You have the fancy clothes. You're drinking out of gold cups. you got all these servants. you got all the chariots and the horses. You could ride in a chariot around your cities and look at the fortified walls and all these things you you could look at everything you could do anything you wanted you had all the luxuries of life and now you found find yourself in prison with the babylonians because god has turned you over and then so th that happens in verse 11 in verse 12 it says in his distress this is talking about manasseh he sought favor of the lord his god and humbled himself greatly before god and his fathers. Manasseh, when he finds himself as a prisoner, he finds himself down in this lowly place, in the worst place, he turns back to God. Why did Manasseh turn back to God when he found himself in a bad situation? Go back to King Hezekiah in chapter 29. He had been taught. He knew. He knew the way of the God. He knew the way of God. He knew what he was supposed to be doing, but he was enjoying the sinning too much, and he had gone so far away from God that, that he just went crazy 
off God's path. And when he found himself in this situation, he knew where to go. And the reason he knew where to go is because his mom and dad had raised him right. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way they sh- in the way they should go. And when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Okay. He found himself older, found himself as a slave in another city because of his sin. And what did he do? He turned back to God. Okay. He remembered what he was supposed to do. And immediately, I don't know how long he was there and how long he was a prisoner, but at some point it got his attention and in his distress, he called out to God in verse 13. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his um, entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. I love this story. Uh, I don't love the sin that Manasseh committed. It breaks my heart to read this and think about him sacrificing his son and worshiping idols. And and Manasseh caused um, his people to do the same thing and follow in his past. But what I love about this story is when he found himself in prison because of his sin, when he found himself down and out and he called out to God in verse 13, and when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved. Um, think of Jonah. You know, Jonah was swallowed by the whale. No, really no different than the prison that Manasseh found himself in. And when Jonah cried out to God, God heard his prayer and God forgave him. And then God spit him out of the whale for the big fish and, and let him go on to do what he had called him to do. Manasseh was the same way when he found himself in prison, he called on to God. It says that God was moved. God forgave him and God put him back in his position of being king because God had things that he wanted him to do. Um, I love my friend, God's forgiveness. Now let's talk about God's forgiveness. You're, you're watching this video and I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on because I don't know everybody who's watching this video, but here's what I can tell you. If you've got sin in your life and you don't have to be to the point where Manasseh was where you're sacrificing your children and you're worshiping idols, all these things. But here's the deal. If you've neglected God in any area of your life, be it your prayer time, your Bible reading, your church attendance, maybe you're reading your Bible and maybe you are praying and maybe you are going to church, but you're not doing this service anymore. You're not teaching Sunday school. You're not helping in children's church. You're not teaching any classes. You're not visiting. You're not doing all the things. You're not singing. You're not using the talent and abilities that God has given you. And you have fallen away from God in the service area. Whatever it is, whatever you're struggling with. Maybe you're watching this today and you were raised in church. You were raised by godly parents. And let's say you're living with someone. You're living in sin. You're not married. You're living with this person. You know what's right. You know that you should be married to that person, that you shouldn't be living with them. I don't know what the sin is that that you're involved in, but here's the deal. Whatever sin you're involved in, all you have to do in your distress, like verse 12, sin puts us in distress with God. And it says in verse 12, in his distress, he called out to God. And that's what you and I need to do is when we have sin in our life, no matter what it is, how big, how small, whatever that sin is, we call out to God and ask him for forgiveness. And if you're a Christian today, my friend, and you call out to him through Jesus, your Lord and Savior, and you ask him for forgiveness, God will be moved because he is a loving and he is a just and he's a forgiving God and he forgives you through the blood of Jesus. So here's the thing I tell you today, my friend, it doesn't matter where you're at. Okay. You ask for forgiveness and I can tell you where you're going. You're going to be on the right path. You're going to be headed in the right direction and he will forgive you. This is why I love the story of Manasseh. So far, so gone, so far off path to be one of the most evil Kings you could possibly imagine. It talks about all the bad things he did and God was moved when he asked for forgiveness. I pray today is that you call on God and you ask him to forgive you of the things that are going on. And you will find, my friend, that he will be moved and he will forgive you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for all your many blessings. And God, I thank you for your forgiveness through Jesus. God, I lift up each and every person watching this video right now. You know where each and every person's at. You know what they're struggling with. You know what they're dealing with. And God, I pray that each person listening will call on you in their distress. And God, I pray that you will be moved and forgive them of their sins. God, I pray that they will get back on the right path and make you 
number one, the first priority in their life. God, I pray you help us to cast out anything that is that we have put in front of you and made more important you. And God, I pray you will cast that out and remove that. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for each and every person watching this. Lord, I pray you bless them. In your name I pray, amen.